This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. All right. Um, welcome to Unsilo. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Roy Baumeister, who uh, is a professor of psychology at the University of Queensland in, in Australia, and also the author of, wow, just countless books. Um, I have only a, a couple of them with me. Um, I think probably the most well-known recent books include ones on uh, willpower, um, rediscovering the greatest human strength, another one called The Power of Bad, How the Negativity Effect Rules Us and How We Can Rule It. But of course, other books on on self-esteem, you have a book on um, meaning of life. (laughs) I mean, well, just to, you know, maybe not be too ambitious. Uh, is there anything good about men? Uh, that was a book I have somewhere around in my house. But your most recent book, I think it's kind of like, a, it's almost like a magnum opus. I think you're drawing a lot of these strands together. And it's called The Self-Explained, Why and How We Become Who We Are. Welcome, Roy. Thanks for having me, Greg. Now, uh, in one of your books, you, you, uh, you mentioned that um, you at one point wanted to become a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> and then you you got diverted into social psychology, but but you've been able to address some deeply philosophical questions through your research, and you know I, I've seen numerous overlaps when you talk about willpower. I had a podcast about acrasia, which is or uh, you know or I forget how sometimes they say it, uh, but about a will, weakness of will. Um, you you have an awful lot to say about uh, education, uh, maybe child rearing, relationships, uh, workplaces. Um, do you think that you are a philosopher at the end of the day? Or do you think that there really, in today's world, is much of a distinction between uh, practical philosophy and, and psychology? Well, there are differences in methods. Uh, it's like philosophers are the expert thinkers and pretty much most of what they do is thinking very carefully and reading other people's thoughts and criticizing them. Uh, Social science, social psychology in particular, is is much more sloppy in a sense, but it's also much more immersed in the world because you have to collect data. Mm -hmm. What what attracted me into this field um, was that I could tackle some of these big philosophical problems only with social science data. I remember the the first one that inspired me on this was back when I was an undergraduate. I did briefly uh, major in philosophy, and I read uh, some of Sigmund Freud's work. So I knew the issues of morality, of what is right and wrong, and where does it come from. The philosophers had thought long and hard about these things, and uh, is the rule of morality embedded in the mind, or is it something we learned, and why do most cultures have the same ones? And Freud instead said, well, we can look at evidence and how do children actually learn what's right and wrong and and relying on the anthropology of his time, which is obviously a century ago or more. uh, But he said we can also look at societies and where their moral values come from and see what the earliest ones. And I thought, well, that is brilliant and fascinating. And so you mentioned the the meaning of life book, and that, that was kind of ambitious for me. But I thought, well, there's not much experimental data about meaning of life. Uh, But once we broaden the focus to say, well, what about happiness and love and work and family and religion? Uh, There are lots of data on all those things. Uh, So that was kind of exciting to me to to preserve the problems but use a different method. No method is perfect, including certainly in the social sciences. Uh, But if we can look for convergence from lots of different methods, uh, that's well. That's probably the best we can do at at, at present. Um, my, unlike most social scientists, I, I'm kind of a generalist. I, I sort of set out to try to figure out what is the big picture, what is human life all about, how does the human mind work. Uh, so instead of staying in one area, which is the formula for having a highly successful career, uh, you work on one or two problems and uh, sort of come up with a definitive solution. Um, instead of those, I have gone and worked in many different areas, uh, all of which, again, I'm trying to amass the social science data. I had a book on why is there evil, which is one of the classic philosophical problems. But again, I didn't approach it as a philosopher. I studied all the data on uh, everything from crime records to 
uh, war atrocities to uh, laboratory studies on aggression and, and tried to pull that together. After that, I was kind of re tired of reading all the bad things. So I remember the hippie days from when I was young, make love, not war. So I just sat down and read research on sexuality mm -hmm. for, uh, this was in the 90s. So there were like 30 years of uh, research in the leading journals. And I just waded through, read all the abstracts, just trying to learn as much as I could about it. So that's, so no, uh, no one would really consider me a philosopher, but I do have interest in those problems, and, and some of my friends are philosophers. We like to talk about the same problems using different approaches. Well, I think your, your latest book might be the most philosophical in a way because you're talking about the self, and your early work was really about um, self-esteem, and um, that presupposes some notion of the self, and, and, and this idea of the self, I mean, this is a concept that psychologists um, often find uh, a bit difficult to, to work with, right? Um, so, you know, is they, they talk about multiple selves, or you know, they, they sometimes talk about the the self as sort of a, an, a a mindless agent of social forces and so forth. I mean, can we even think about psychology without a notion of the self? <laughs> I think it's pretty indispensable. Again, you could work on some specific uh, problems in psychology. Uh, certainly going into the brain and studying how the brain works, you don't need to have much of a sense of self in that. One, one reviewer of one of my papers made a great comment that if we look at which disciplines question the self versus which ones have to assume it and find it indispensable, that's revealing. And I, I, I went and did that and it was long and hard to basically the ones that take more than one person uh, need selves you couldn't talk about the marriage without the selves of the two people yeah. in it uh, but the psychologists who study little mental processes like you know why does the, the the mind remember the first things in a list better than the stuff in the middle well you don't need need much self for that and so the the, the cognitive and the, the brain people, I mean, sometimes they get interested in the self too, but they don't really need it the way, say, an economist would need selves because, you know, you couldn't talk about a marketplace without buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have different interests and, and different goals and, and different ways of making decisions. So um, psychology is kind of on the border. Uh, some parts of it could get by without a self but the more interpersonal ones. And, and that's one of the main conclusions in the book you mentioned is that uh, the self is there for dealing with others. It's not something that emerged out of some private need of the brain. Uh, in a sense, the, the animal versions of self are more like that. I, I think one of the early things is, is um, the brain using a system to move the body. Uh, you coordinate the uh, the paws, say, for an animal to run around. Or uh, I remember watching my daughter master crawling, and uh, you know, up till that point, we put her down and she stayed there. <laughs> but she was on the floor and she managed to roll over and was working out. It's right, right hand, left knee, left hand, right knee, alternate front and back diagonal. You have to have all those things figured, uh, and 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 move there to move the body uh, but it's not interpersonal again that's about as far as most animals get because yeah. they live in a, in a kind of solipsistic world uh, I mean they know that there are others but they don't really understand that other minds have different ideas from their own I mean, if you have a dog you know the dog doesn't really understand that petting you is boring for you or petting her is boring for you uh, she thinks petting is wonderful and, and, and it, it just fills the universe with, with, with joy so once we've understood we're in a community of minds, the minds with different ideas, that changes a lot. And the self is there to help us participate uh, uh, in society. Okay, you also mentioned the, uh, the belief in multiple selves. And uh, this is a sign psychology hasn't really come together about what the self is. There are people who say there's no self, that it's just an illusion. And there are people who say there's one self and there are people who say there are multiple selves and everyone has, has lots of different selves. Uh, so how do they get along? Well, each of them has some key ideas that are worth understanding and using, but the, 
the right answer is one, as the essential the self is about the creation of unity, uh, first in the body for walking, and then with humans across time, so that you, you have a reputation, you have credentials that go with you from, from childhood into, uh, into old age. People who talk about multiple selves, they don't really mean it. Uh, they're different versions of the same self. Uh, you know, they say, oh, like, well, you're kind of a different self when you're at home uh, with a family than when you're at work. Well, that's true, but if you borrowed money, you still owe the money, whether you're at home or at work. Uh, and you still have the same name, and you still have the relationships, and uh, uh, so they may be slightly different versions, with different values and traits and so on, but it's it's the same you. The same thing with the people who say there's no, so, no self, that it's an illusion. Uh, I notice they still put their names uh, <laughs> on their books, uh, I, I'm tempted to ask them, well, you know, next time you want to take an airplane flight, go and uh, don't take any identification with you, because that would imply that there's a self there. Uh, so don't take them. You just explain to them that selves are illusions, and they should just give you a seat on the airplane because it doesn't matter. It's just someone's going to fly there. And see how far that gets. Uh, probably not past security. Uh, but again, the, the selves, the need for them is less inside the single mind that in the social system, which is why when you get on an airplane, you have to prove that you're really the person who bought the ticket uh, rather than someone else, because it makes a difference, partly for, for safety and security issues. So, you know, in economics, we, we have this exercise where we start off with our Robinson Crusoe uh, on the island, right? And Robinson Crusoe has to make various decisions. And, you know, we think of Robinson Crusoe as... Uh, a self. We th we think of Robinson Crusoe uh, making inferences about you know the relationship between current actions and, and future consequences and so forth. So there is some temporal notion of of, of a self. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but and in psychology also, you know, I guess cognitive psychology or there's certain aspects of of psychology which are kind of focused on the, the individual's interaction with the. Uh, the, the world but but I think your your point is that the full the complete notion of self is is one that is inevitably social right so what what is what kind of notion does a self have if they're in in complete isolation I mean one of the interesting things you said is that when you're completely by yourself you don't think in terms of you know my book you think in terms of the the book right um, so to what extent is is sort of the 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 expectations that others have about you or the desire to shape those expectations, um, the source of this social self? Well, that's very much it. Uh, in, in terms of human evolution, the, the two big advances are communication and cooperation. These are things we do far more capably and f more successfully and far more extensively than any other animals. Uh, including the, the apes, our closest relatives. So uh, those are both about relating to others. By sharing information and by working together, we can survive and reproduce way better. That's how natural selection works, of course, uh, way better than other creatures. Um, so the distinctive parts of the human self evolved to help us relate to others. Uh, the self is very much uh, about that. Uh, re preparing for this book, and I think I, I talked about it in the uh, in the book to some degree. That people who've gone off and lived by themselves in isolation for uh, long periods of time uh, had no contact with other humans and so on. And uh, the, the one of the guys he was saying, "Well, this is going to be my chance to get into myself and find myself and learn about." It. And he he took copious notes of all his thoughts on it and stuff. But when he went back to write the book, he said, "I disappeared from my own narrative. Uh, the, there was no use for the self uh, by by the second uh, the second year. I was writing about what the birds were doing and what the temperature was, but it was all about the environment." There, the, the inner stuff uh, that I was was looking for, the, there was none of that. You don't really need much of a self uh, when uh, if you're completely alone. I mean, think about it. You wouldn't need a name. You wouldn't need a. You wouldn't have social roles. You wouldn't have a reputation. Um, there'd be no point to morality. You, you wouldn't own things. 
Um, all these things are highly important in a, in a kind of society that humans create, uh, but uh, not by yourself. I mean, you, it's your toothbrush. Uh, if you had a toothbrush, I don't know how you'd get one if you lived alone. Uh, but if you had a toothbrush, it would be the toothbrush, not yours. So the point of having it be your toothbrush is so other people don't use it. If there aren't any other people, you don't need to think of it as, oh, well, that's my toothbrush. Uh, is That would, would never come up. So even ownership, which we think of as a relationship between a person and a thing, uh, really only matters in a, in a social context where there are other people. If, if, if I own it, that means it's mine and not someone else's, and I can use it when I want, and anyone else should ask me for permission. And, uh, I can sell it, but nobody else can. Uh, all those only matter in a, in, a, in a social environment with other people. You know, it reminded me a lot of how we view uh, corporate liability in the law, right? So, you know, um, if somebody is uh, acting and commits a tort, right, we, if we assign liability to the the corporation, right, then the corporation is going to start keeping track of the, the, the behavior of that, that individual. And so, you know, the the coherence of the organization and the, the, the sense of that organization being an agent only makes sense if we impose some kind of liability on all of the different, you know, elements of that corporation, right? So if, if, if we're holding someone accountable for an action that they, they took in the past, then that's going to kind of get that individual to start connecting very quickly uh, current actions with future consequences, right? Yes, yes. And I've read arguments that the limited liability corporation was one of the great invest inventions of Western culture and uh, partly responsible for its rise to the top of the world, uh, the world powers. Um, you go back what, half a dozen centuries. Um, in some ways, the Middle East, the Arab cultures there were more advanced, but they never got this. And which means if you undertook a business venture with someone else and it failed, you would lose all your, mm -hmm. your property. So by forming a corporation, well, the corporation can lose all its property, but it doesn't take away the houses and the savings and the, mm -hmm. the jewelry uh, of the individual members. Mm -hmm. So again, that's a social construction to make an, a company be an artificial kind of self uh, for very you know, powerfully advantageous social reasons mm -hmm. uh, operating in a complicated system. So, so the self is, in many ways, it's the it's a social construction in the same way, right? Uh, well, yes. Again, it starts with the body, but uh, it, it soon moves on beyond it, and uh, much of what you are, uh, again, is uh, exists only there in the social world. And going back to even back when I was doing my dissertation, and I, I realized, you know, I'd started out interested in self esteem, but I realized. It's other esteem that matters more. What you mm. think of yourself has only limited consequences, uh, whereas what others think of you, that is, you know, throughout history and prehistory, that is a chief determinant of even how long you're going to live and certainly how well you're going to live. Uh, that's why in the book I, I came around, people have multiple concepts of themselves. They can be their most positive self and their humble, modest self and their, you know, p potential... Uh, different versions. Uh, but the most important is the desired reputation. It's how you want other people to view you because that sets the goals and guidelines. And what you do when nobody's looking, well, doesn't matter nearly as much as what you do <laughs> when mm -hmm. everybody's looking. Mm -hmm. And well, a big part of your story is how people e internalize, right, this external observer. I mean, there's a long tradition, right, in philosophy about the the internalized observer, right? I mean, Adam Smith talks about this. You, you talk a bit about this, right? So the evolution of, of morality. So is, is morality then kind of a, I don't know, a, a mnemonic or a, a rule that is just a whole lot easier to follow, right? If, if it's internalized, I mean, it kind of reduces the amount of, of thinking that you have to do when it comes to make, making decisions. Um, because you, you can imagine that morality you're... you're your reputation would not be impaired if you if you did sort of immoral acts in a way that was not observable, right? Right. 
Right. Uh, it only affects your reputation if others find out. Um, I've, morality is a field that psychology has been moving very fast in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, you know, back in the late 20th century, the research on it was 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 rather slow and guided by thinking about stages of judgment and so on. Um, but and so my thinking about it has continued to evolve and change fairly rapidly and I, I don't know that I know everything I certainly don't know everything um, but uh, my, my take on it well what gets people to embrace morality why do they find it useful to do that well again we evolved to communicate and cooperate so it means your survival is essentially dependent on whether other people want to cooperate with you so you need to figure out how to behave to to keep uh, cooperative partners uh, in the future and to attract others. And morality is kind of a blueprint for that. Um, morality is a set of rules that if you act this way and do the right things, other people will be glad mm -hmm. to work with you and cooperate with you. You know those studies, uh, Thomas Ello and uh, Lab and others, where they'll, they'll train a couple apes to work together for something or they have to pull a rope at the same time mm -hmm. uh, so that they uh, get a reward and they only get it if they work together. Well, the apes can learn this, but then what happens when the reward comes, the big one hogs it all, and then pretty soon the little one doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to do it anymore. Uh, so that's what prevented their ape society and culture from moving forward and, and producing more resources because the, the cooperation is undermined by that. And, and with humans, where we have more of a sense of it, uh, then we realize, well, if I cheat this person or betray by essentially hogging the reward myself, even though I could, and, and that's the natural thing to be tempted to do if there's food and you're the big animal, uh, take whatever you want. Uh, but projecting into the future, that will be costly for me. And with humans, it's even worse because not only cooperation, there's also communication, as in gossip, so if, if you cooperate with somebody and then hog the reward and betray him, not only do you lose him or her as a future partner, but that person's going to tell everybody mm -hmm. else. Pretty soon nobody will, will cooperate you, with you. So it became that much more urgent to find out how to act to, to maintain a good reputation uh, so other people will work with you. And it goes straight again to the survival and reproduction, uh, the, the biological criteria of success. I think what, what puzzles economists is, right, you know, you give people the opportunity to, say, flip a coin in, in secret, and they're rewarded for a particular outcome. And so, of course, we, we see um, a higher probability that they're going to uh, come up with the, the reward-generating outcome than you mm -hmm. would expect by chance. But, but you don't get 100%, right? That's, a, that's, I think, you know, surprising, right. right? So an economist would predict that you would have, say, 100% heads when, when you allow people to, to do this coin flip. Yes, but, I, but, but you only get like 60% like or 65%, right? So, so, <laughs> so, so, the, so that's yeah, the part the, that the, needs the, explaining, right? The 35% that, that, the that don't. The of the rational economist is, has a certain charm to it. Uh, yes, that... Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, economists think everyone should just do what's what's best for them uh, if they can get away with it. You know, they understand, of course, the, the contingencies that if if you're seen to betray or cheat, take care of other people, well, that has that has costs for you. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's if it's private and you can get away with it, uh, then yes, economists might expect everyone would do it. Um, but no, we are better than that. We do give people a chance. We do try. Uh, to cooperate uh, with each other. Um, there's also the question of how much people believe what they do is really secret, because especially in the mm -hmm. modern world, <laughs> more and more you have to realize. I think, uh, Zuckerberg, yeah. the Facebook guy, was saying that you know the days when you could act differently in different situations and get away with it are are, are gone. Uh, and uh, well, there's still privacy and still some some areas where it's being defended but it's certainly shrinking and many people are finding things are a lot more public than they expected I when you describe a couple the, you describe a couple experiments where you you were monitoring the the activity of your subjects without without them knowing 
Uh, yes, because because it, it's it's important to know. But uh, we wanted to see you know how much of a difference there was uh, mm-hmm. between between public and private. You know, people do clearly change their behavior deliberately when they know someone mm-hmm. else is watching and evaluating them. Uh, but uh, whether it's completely private, um, I don't know. I'm often tempted to think so, and yet, uh, but yet. Yes, you're right. There does seem to be a bit of moral behavior, even in private. Mm-hmm. Um, or, uh, you know, the trust game is another one. I remember people looking into that, and again, the economists think, well, you shouldn't trust them at all because you could lose. Uh, but the but the willingness to at least try the person once. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not like we're completely trusting or completely cooperative, but when thrown together with a stranger, there's sort of a sense, well, we should at least give it a try. And if mm-hmm. the other person misbehaves or acts badly, people are quite ready to pull back and and trust is gone. But just getting us to the point where, okay, we'll give a stranger a chance, that was huge compared to what other other animals do, and that's what enabled the cooperation, I think, to get started, which then proved so uh, so successful. Now, there's one version of the trust game that you described in The Power of Bad where the, the different treatments uh, involved telling the subjects that the um, initial pie uh, belonged to them and they could split it as they wanted. I mean, it was a sequence of dictator games, I suppose. Uh, versus mm-hmm. saying that the the pie belonged to the the other person and they could figure out how much they wanted to take and 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 this this really highlighted this concept of of loss aversion and I think loss aversion is in many ways at the heart of the book um, the the power of bad so it, I think to summarize I mean the book it's really all about how we are more sensitive to bad news, adverse events, failures negative information than the opposite. Uh, and, and you articulate kind of a evolutionary reason for this. So, you know, why is it that we are so sensitive to negative information? I mean, you, you talk about a couple examples where, you know, trust is gained in inches per year and lost in, you know, miles per, per second. The, there, there are lots of other examples where, you know, one small failure will, will kill you, uh, but, you know, small successes just you know they don't they don't kill you so so is is it just because there's a, there's an asymmetry in terms of 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 consequences well i i have to think so when we started doing this i remember noticing the loss aversion and then, then there was one other area where they talked about it a little bit the uh uh, psychology of first impressions that so when you meet somebody new and you learn something bad about them it has a much bigger impact on your overall impression than learning a, a corresponding good thing. And so I said, well, let's look at different areas and see whether this is true in others, and we'll see where it is and where it isn't, and that'll sort of say exactly what situations this, this bias is suited for. And they researched and searched. We found lots of evidence of it, but we didn't find any exceptions. It just seemed to be true everywhere, which was in a way disappointing <laughs> because it would have made a more interesting theory to say, well, you know, Good is stronger than bad in the future, but bad is stronger than good in the past. Uh, none of that worked out. But it also added the excitement of this must be one of the basic principles mm-hmm. of how the mind works. And so, given how it's everywhere, ubiquitous, uh, made me think, yeah, it probably has to be something that's hardwired probably by evolution. And as we put it, uh, uh, life has to win every day. Death only has to win once. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you make one fatal mistake, that that could be the end. And, and even if it doesn't quite kill you, um, you eat something that makes you really sick, uh, oh, you don't want to have anything that even tastes like that again. Um, so yes, the consequences of the mistake uh, of missing something bad are terrible, so you have to be hyper-vigilant for that, certainly mm-hmm. in the in the jungle or the primeval forest. Missing something good or not following up on what might be good, well, that's, that's too bad, but it doesn't kill you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you find some mushrooms in the forest and you're hungry. Uh, well, 
you eat them, they could kill you <laughs> if you eat them. If you don't eat them, well, you'll be hungry for a while longer. Uh, be hungry for a while longer. But uh, um, again, it doesn't uh, doesn't kill you. Doesn't make you spend three days with a high fever, vomiting your guts out. So, in other words, it's, it's ecologically rational in 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 some kind of environments, but it, it's certainly not in other in environments, right? So in an environment where you're not confronting death on a, on a regular basis, it, it, seems, um, it seems dysfunctional, right? So, uh, I mean, you talk about ways that we can, we can well, overcome this, right? Um, yeah, but again, it, it is functional in many ways, uh, like the research on working teams. One bad member of the team does a lot of damage to the the team if you know you put one bad person in a in a group that was otherwise working great and they can sort of undermine the whole ethos of it putting one good person on a bad team doesn't doesn't have anywhere near the same effect mm -hmm. uh, and so advice to managers and team builders and so on is avoid the bad apples avoid the ones who will get in there that's more important uh, than say taking a risk for someone who might might be great but might be terrible. Uh, so there are many contexts in which the downside uh, of a risk, and even with the basic money things, I, I can argue. I don't know all the thoughts economists have had about uh, about loss aversion, but uh, um, I mean it'd be great to get an extra, say, a large sum of money if you could double your fifty thousand dollar investment. A uh, hundred thousand. Okay, that that's really good. But losing your fifty thousand dollar investment, you know, unless you're some kind of multimillionaire, that's a that's a severe blow. In fact, I think the, even the multimillionaires uh, get upset about losing fifty thousand. Uh, but for an ordinary person, yeah, you know, losing the same amount is is more costly than gaining the same amount is positive. Just yeah, we spent it. Loss of well, we spend an awful lot of time in business school trying to um, get people to overcome this loss aversion bias, right, which we call it, right? So, you know, if you think back to even this example of where you put one bad apple into uh, a company and it has disproportional damage, but but that's because, right, their, their coworkers re respond disproportionately to the negativity of this, this person, right? So if, if, if all of those coworkers were, you know, had their their – their loss aversion kind of eliminated, then this, this guy couldn't do that much harm. So, so I guess part of the question is, to what extent do we just take people as given and then try to work with the, the bias? And to what extent do we try to change it? So in, in, you, know, you, you have some wonderful advice uh, for people in relationships, right? which is the, 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 the positivity ratio, right? And I think this is great advice. You want to make sure that you have four positives for every negatives. But but I guess if you were, if you were if you had a relationship with somebody who was had somehow debiased themselves, then you know, you'd only need <laughs> one point one positives for every negative, right? And so, you know, should you internally try to kind of manage the disproportionate impact? I mean, if you are in a relationship that has a, a ratio that is less than four to one, can you can you somehow convince yourself that the bad isn't as bad as, as it seems, and, and the good is, is better than it seems? People do have an extensive capacity for self-deception or self-influence. Uh, so, yes, uh, people will try to do it. And uh, uh, for better and for worse, people have done this. People I mean, stay in abusive relationships uh, much longer than seems rational. Uh, convincing themselves, well, that was, I won't do it again. And, um, uh, well, I wasn't thinking about saying, abusive relationships. Be, I mean, you, you mentioned Judge G Justice Ginsburg, who <laughs> received some marital advice from her, her mother, which was, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's good to be a little deaf, right? <laughs> so so that, that's presumably sort of a, a way of, of, of changing how you, you, you think about the, the negatives and the positives, right? Yes, if you tune them out and let let things go for a while, uh, some of these economic games things, uh, it's the same. They look at uh, if 
they're they're cooperating over and over and then the person defects and takes advantage of them once or uh or, or do, and then do they continue do they forgive yeah. and let it go and and it's sort of necessary uh to do i mean there there's a interesting gender difference on there that the, the women tended to think uh if the other person betrayed me once that's it they're out i, I don't forgive that yeah we call and that the grim well. grim trigger strategy in in, in game theory yeah okay that would be uh, that would be a word I haven't heard, but that's uh, a term. Uh, but it makes sense. Uh, whereas the men were more willing to let it go for a while, and uh, you know, the men have a lot more partnerships with other men than women do to be productive over a long period of time. Uh, the way I put it, if you work with somebody over a, um, a couple decades, well, probably at some point they're going to be difficult and unpleasant and. Uh, if you say that's it, I'm not putting up with this, then the relationship ends. Uh, but sometimes, if you can get through that and understand, maybe you're not the easiest person to get along with sometimes either, mm -hmm. <laughs> and have a little more lower standards and a little more forgiving aspect, then you can uh, preserve the partnership and be productive over a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. But so, if, if, if what, what I was trying to say is that the debiasing can be good or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could get people over the the negativity bias, and I, I don't know that people could entirely get over it. It seems to be so so basic to how the mind works. But you could certainly control it and reduce it and uh, override uh, some of its impulses. Um, and whether that's a good thing or not, I mean, we evolved for one kind of social life, and we live in a very different one. Um, but probably getting along with people over a long period of time is, if anything, less important in the modern world because there's so many more people. You lived in a band of 50 people. Uh, once someone became your enemy, uh, you're still stuck with living them uh, until one of you dies. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the subtitle of your book, The Power of Bad, is, is um, how, to, how we can rule it, right? And I think there's two aspects to this. One is you know, how you internally deal with the negativity bias. But but there's another aspect, which is how you can leverage it to motivate people, right? And and this gets into, you know, the use of, of carrots uh, ver versus sticks. And I think there's a connection here with, with the, the self-esteem uh, research that you did. And, and I think there's a dominant view in both parenting and in education that you kind of you know, get more, uh, you get more with, with, with honey than with, with vinegar, right? And that the carrots generally work better than, than, than the sticks. And, and I think you, you, you highlight perhaps that perhaps this is, this is true. misguided. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be not true. I mean, they were very nicely controlled studies, for example, where they, uh, give children a, a jar and every time they got an answer right, they get a marble that they could keep and put in the jar. And other children did the same problems, just they started with a full jar of marbles, and every time they got one wrong, a marble was taken away. Well, those children learn faster. <laughs> Punishment uh, makes you learn more than reward. Now, I understand the education establishment has ambivalence about punishment. Uh, it can create resentment and, and other things. But purely in terms of learning, uh, if you only have one or the other, uh, the punishment and criticism work better uh, than the praise and support. And certainly praising people and telling them they're doing great when they're not has to have some cost in the long run, although it feels good to all concerned uh, to do that. So I, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, the informationally, the best thing is to get both praise and criticism. Right. My, my, my dissertation advisor, the great psychologist Edward E. Jones, his educational philosophy was all criticism. <laughs> the criticism is really careful and precise and thorough. You didn't need to praise people. I think mm -hmm. I remember all four of the positive things he said to me during my five years in graduate school. Um, four years, I guess it was. Um, but later then I worked with someone else who gave both praise and criticism. I said, oh my goodness, I can learn a whole lot faster here to, to know what you're doing right as well as what you're doing wrong. I mean, if the only feedback that you get it right is that you know you get the page back and there's nothing written or corrected on there, no notes mm -hmm. in the margins or crossing out. If that's <laughs> the absence of negative is the only positive, well, that you need a pretty strong self-assurance to 
survive in an environment like that. Uh, and even so, you don't know if, well, was he lazy? Was he not interested in this? Uh, or did he really think that was good? So so clearly both kinds of feedback are important, but but it's, it's clear if just to speed up learning, the negative is better than the positive. I think in the book we even mentioned that study with the teachers where they they uh, took the teachers in the Chicago schools and half of them were offered a bonus if their kids would mm-hmm. score above a, a certain level uh, at the end of the year. And the other half were given the bonus in advance and told if your kids don't score above that level, we'll take it back. So it's exactly the same performance criterion in the kids, exactly the same amount of money. Uh, it's just framed as a positive you will get this or a negative you will lose it and the kids I mean, for the teachers who had given the money in advance they learned better they scored better on the objective test the kids didn't know anything about the incentive or or whatever that was not not part of it it was in the teachers minds but somehow the teachers did a better job when they were afraid of being punished by having mm-hmm. money taken away uh than rewarded hope for being rewarded uh for getting the same amount of money well, I mean, I don't really understand how you can learn if you're not kind of making making mistakes, right? So, you know, in in data science, right, we, we, we all, you know, we, we, we look at errors, right? And we're trying to, you know, minimize errors. But the, the only way to, you know, f- find out where to draw the boundary is to, you know, push it until you start generating errors. And if you're not generating any errors, then you really don't have a, you don't have a model. And so, so I think you, you highlight that, you know, if learning, particularly when you're, when you're younger, when you're doing most of the learning, uh, that's where it's, it's essential to, you know, run into mistakes and, and run into errors. Uh, I know if, you know, you have a coach, uh, I, I ride horses and I, and I figure like, if I'm, if I'm not falling off once in a while, then, then I'm probably, you know, <laughs> I'm probably not, uh, you know, learning a whole lot because I'm staying in my, my comfort zone, but, but people, people don't like it. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher and, and I know that if I start giving out low grades, I'm going to have I'm going to have to have a talk with the dean because there's going to be people with students with pitchforks, uh, you know, out there. <laughs> if I if I if I start, you know, pointing out the deficiencies of of student um, arguments in, in in class and in front of their peers, that's that's going to make it even worse for me. So so why is it that so many people don't appreciate the the need for uh, some some correction and and I guess the second question is don't people just recalibrate so for instance don't they see hey you know you gave me an A plus instead of an A plus 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 don't they just think of that as a C right <laughs> or, or or I mean isn't grade and don't we just discount grade inflation and and just re- reset our our parameters and and just view you know an A minus as a as a as a as a serious criticism. Uh, there may be some of that. Uh, one of the general patterns in psychology, and this is not my own work, uh, this is just what I've read in others, is that all these corrections for biases tend to undercorrect. Mm. Mm-hmm. So you might know that an A plus is better than an A minus, but an A minus is is okay. You're, you're not you're not as upset as if it were a C uh, in the in the olden days. Um, I think the great inflation and the self-esteem movement, all these things going together, and and uh, I think they're they're costly. Uh, like you said, if you criticize students or give bad grades, you're going to have a, a confrontation or a, a call from the dean uh, that y- you need to change. Well, if you're being unfair, that's one thing, but uh, but what if you're actually just Grading the students on a curve and giving the top ten percent A's and uh, uh, and so on the way it, it, it used to be back you know when I was in school uh, A's were few and far between. Um, it's possibly better for learning uh, to give people accurate feedback and tell them when when they do things wrong. Telling them they're doing well when they're not doesn't in, in, encourage learning. And so I, I think that's weakened the, the enterprise uh, in terms of education in, in, in the United States. I, I like this idea of having giving two grades where you, you give the, the real grade and then you give the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the fake grade. Doing that. Harvey Mansfield, da- I think there was, I think. Da- was it Daniel Gilbert who was doing it? I, I can't. 
Uh, Mansfield, I think. Oh, Harvey Mansfield, right. So um, yeah. I, I wonder if there's evidence that people actually pay attention <laughs> to the to the to the real grade, um, because it seems like people don't want that that kind of feedback, right? I mean, I, I tell I tell my students if 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 all your friends um, think you're great, then you should you should get new friends, <laughs> right? Because uh, they're not going to be be of much use to you. Well, you do want friends who have a positive attitude about you. Um, I, I assume people do prefer more f of that sort of friend. Uh, but uh, but yes, you're not learning as fast, and not you know if you're not being criticized or being told that what you did is fine, even when it's not fine, it's essentially lowering the standards. Um, it's an interesting thing throughout our culture: the retreat from merit mm -hmm. uh, and the. the turning against it and it's gone farther in some places than others uh, I suspect it, it weakens the society uh, on on the whole mm -hmm. I was visiting uh, in in France uh, uh, this past year and I had some very hard-working good colleagues there that I was talking to but I said it's frustrating because there's no merit in terms of what you're paid as a professor it's just how long you've held the position and so you publish 20 things a year or you publish nothing, you get the same raise. And uh, and they would sometimes try to bring this up and say, well, like in America, shouldn't the people who produce more, who do better work, shouldn't they get paid more? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, against it. You can see why lots of people are against it because mm. you know, they settle in and say, well, yeah, there's no reason to work that hard. Uh, but, but look, if incentives just produce better results. But if people uh, avoid the unpleasantness of bad news, right, in the classroom with respect to personal feedback, it, it seems like they, they don't try to avoid it when we look at their social media news feed. Right? So you, you talk about how, you know, if it, if it, lead, if it bleeds, it leads. And there are these uh, availability entrepreneurs. I, I think of them sort of as the... Uh, uh, anxiety industrial complex, right, <laughs> which is vying for our attention. So that there's this stream of, of bad news that, that people gravitate towards. So, so, you know, why is it that people gravitate towards, towards bad news? Why don't they carve out a bubble where they can block all the, the bad news and, and be surrounded by, uh, you know, the good news? I mean, in other words, why don't people – and engage in this Pollyanna strategy that you talk about, uh, which is is a way yeah, of sort of well, keep, uh, keeping the bad new, bad news at bay, or at least keeping it within within proportional to the to the to the actual amount of bad news there is. They do that to some degree within their own lives. I mean, many people have remarked on the uh, the the statistical improbability that. Uh, 90% plus of married couples say they have a very happy marriage, but 50% of them end up getting a divorce. Uh, well, how is that possible? Uh, obviously, when the bad ones get divorced, they're no longer part of it, but you'd think there would be plenty of future divorces. But it seems like they rationalize, they do what you're saying, Pollyanna, maybe it's not so bad, up until about the last six or eight months. Uh, then it all comes together. It's 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 one thing I realized in the... You know, my that meaning of life book I'm looking at, at relationship change uh, I called it the, the crystallization of discontent because you know you have a good day and a bad day and another good day and another bad day and and so on and you sort of well everyone has a bad day you know marriage is perfect and, and so on but when the bad days become a bad year mm -hmm. you can think all right uh, then it's time to think maybe about getting a divorce or, or breaking up but it takes a long time to get there. There have to be a fair amount of those those negative ones. So people will rationalize and Pollyannaize and 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 so on in their uh, in their personal lives. Uh, but in terms of what sells the news, there's no question people are more interested in bad news. It it, it grabs their attention. Again, the mind is attuned to it and is is watchful for it. You want the news to tell you what's important, what's going on in the world, and. 
uh, well, bad things are happening that could affect you that you might know about. Good things, okay, they, they somehow are less urgent. And if, as I said, if you missed one back in the primeval forest, it, it had no serious long-term consequences compared to uh, missing the snake that's going to bite you and kill you. Uh, yes, uh, my co-author on that book, uh, John Tierney, was a journalist. He was the first author. Um, he he resonated to this stuff right away. I was doing it with the scientific psychology. He said, oh, absolutely, in, in journalism, everything has to be a crisis. Uh, you know, if you want to get on the first page, you have to make it seem a lot uh, worse than it is. And, you know, now this is spreading through our society, especially with uh, the political polarization that, uh, you know, want to pretend that the other side is really in league with the devil uh, and, and you know, exaggerating how, how, how dangerous and destructive mm -hmm. the other side's policies are. Um, and the news media play into that, depending on which side they're biased toward uh, as well. That's what, what helps them. I mean, they're in a business trying to give people what they want. Uh, or what they think people want. Well, I think there's connections between the book on Power Bad and the book on, on Willpower. Uh, I think maybe one of your more famous um, findings has to do with this idea of willpower and, and ego depletion. So, you know, there are techniques that, 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 that we can use. Uh, you, you say at one point that, um, I think you, you said that self-control is probably the uh, most important problem plaguing us in, in, in the modern society, in part because we're, we're exposed to so many temptations. And, and one of the temptations, of course, is to is to tap into this continuous stream of, of bad news. And, and, and you offer a, uh, a strategy for dealing with it, which is the, the, the low bad diet, right? <laughs> the low bad diet is just like any other kind of diet, and, and it requires some some self-control. Uh, there was another example that you talked about in the book, which is this guy, I can't remember, the Arkansas football coach who um, never punts on fourth down. So right now right. as we're speaking, we're, we're talking during uh, playoff <laughs> weekend. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if this coach had to evaluate each and every punt opportunity in, in isolation, then he would be much more inclined, presumably, to punt because he would then think about the negative consequences of failure. But the way in which he, he avoids that is by s s laying out a rule ahead of time and then, and then referencing the, the rule. So it's, it's almost like a, an institutionalization of, of, of a habit, right? Because a habit is, is like a rule. So can, yeah. can you talk a bit about sort of, well, maybe in the context of the, the low bad diet, how, how, how can we in, in, in general – uh, overcome this, this this weakness of will, and and why do you think you know this notion of weakness of will, which the philosophers have been talking about for millennia, ha has been so kind of understudied in the psychology literature? Well, that's a bunch of questions. Yeah, <laughs> in very different directions. Uh, the reason for understudied. Uh, it's more difficult to get at self-control. I mean, you, psychologists started studying self-esteem pretty early and pretty easily because you can ask people, how good are you at this? Do people like you? Are you successful? And so on. Um, self-control, it's, it's not so much just what you think of yourself. It's what you actually do. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people might say they have high self-control, but they don't really know what it means or they don't, don't really have have a sense of that um, when I was studying the self and doing my early career I went to a lot of conferences on the self and they say well we know a lot about how people think about themselves and so on and uh, we know how they relate to others and things like that but how the agent works how the decision making controlling part that was a big mystery and, and so that kind of tempted me to, to, to dive in and uh, see what we could uh, could learn about that um, so I think it was just a more difficult problem and, and uh, even just what to do with it in the laboratory uh, that slowed down the, uh, the progress in that area. Um, now, what were the other parts of your question? <laughs> well, so what are some of the, some of the techniques? I mean, well, one of the things that I found interesting was that you were, you're talking about Victorians, right? And, and it was really hard to 
get get in you know get them to to understand the the mechanisms they were using but once they discovered them they could then you know do something about it whereas in today's world uh you know the the self discovery seems to be the easiest part <laughs> and then the 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 taking action to to overcome is it seems to be the hard part is is that just is it just simply that in modernity we're exposed to way more temptations than than we have been in, historically well no the, the argument that was made there was was sort of a a critique by later generations of freudians who are using freudian therapy and say it doesn't seem to work as well as it did for old sigmund himself but he was dealing with people who were brought with very strict upbringings who then had a very strong, what he called the superego, which is what we would call self-control and inhibition and a variety of other things. Um, so, so his therapy worked by if, if you have a neurotic problem, there's something in your unconscious that makes you react badly to this and it causes you trouble. And so if they could just make that conscious, then the person would see, oh, Yes, I am screwing myself up by having this reaction. I got to watch for it and change. And they had enough self-discipline because of the strict upbringing that they could implement it. Uh, what they were saying already in the, the late 50s and 60s of the, the last century was that it was easier to get people to have the insight because the defenses weren't so strong that this is right and this is wrong and this is the way the world is and you don't question it. They could get them to see, but then they didn't have the strength of character mm -hmm. uh, to follow through and uh, and implement the changes. And so well, they would make a change, but then they would backslide and uh, and so on. And th there may well be trade offs. The the Victorians, uh, you know, used to make fun of them for uh, all their strict morality and things like that, but. Building character, the idea that if you exert self-control on a regular basis, you will become a stronger person. Mm -hmm. uh, and when adversity happens, you'll be better able to stand up for it. That was true. And, and modern work, some of my own, some of other people's, has, has found the same thing, that uh, mm -hmm. daily, regular exercise of self-control does make you stronger. Uh, so we think of self-control works kind of like a muscle. When you use it, it gets tired. That's the immediate depleted willpower, ego depletion effect. Um, um, but uh, uh, when it recovers, especially if you do it regularly, as with a muscle exercise, uh, it, it becomes uh, stronger. I think there are a couple meta-analyses of studies from multiple continents and so on saying, well, yes, it really does uh, seem to work, even with uh, young adults, that you can, you can still improve your, your self-control. Mm -hmm. So I've talked to philosophers who talk about character fitness as being similar to physical fitness in that practice does does help, right? right? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and so so if you were trying to strengthen your your willpower, I mean, one approach would be to intentionally expose yourself to to temptation, smaller temptations, and then increasingly larger temptations. But but you also advocate the notion of just architecting your life so as to minimize the the amount of of temptation right to, to what extent are those two strategies complementary yes well those are interesting uh, using self-control is the harder way to do it if you want to build up your strength of character then you've got to expose yourself to temptation and and overcome it you know, take a cold shower even though you know the warm water would feel good you know force yourself to do it but uh, if, you know, taking cold showers may indeed make you a stronger person. Uh, but if your goal is to change the behavior, not to strengthen your character, then avoiding temptation works a lot better. Uh, I mean, willpower works, but it's costly. Um, and so um, you want to go on a diet, get rid of the fattening food out of your house so that you aren't... Uh, uh, tempted, mm -hmm. it won't build your character as, as as would you know looking at the ice cream and cookies and potato chips and everything every day and resisting them would mm -hmm. probably strengthen your character, but you're less likely to have the lapse and your diet will go better. Mm -hmm. Now, is it, is this are these? Um, I mean, 
is this idea of depleting willpower, I mean, is it is there any domain specificity? So in other words, if you have are trying to resist social media, you know, all day, uh, and then and then you're confronted <laughs> with, you know, with uh, with a cigarette, are, are you more inclined to to smoke the cigarette if you've spent all day trying to resist the siren call of of social media? Or do you have sort of separate separate domains, separate budgets, right? Separate accounts of 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 willpower depending on the temptation. Um in principle there are no separate budgets. It's a what we call a domain general resource. So uh if you spent the day resisting social media or trying not to say swear words in front of the children or um making yourself do extra work, uh, chopping wood or, or whatever you put yourself to do, yes, then you're depleted, and then whatever else comes along is more likely to happen. I won't say there's no, I won't say there's zero special budgets, but we sure don't have evidence of that yet. Mm -hmm. uh, indeed, most experiments we did, did and other people did deliberately manipulated the depletion with one task and then measured something as different as they could uh, to look for the, 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 the general effect. Um, people do get tired doing the same thing if it, uh, uh, if it takes your willpower. I mean, one of the things we started with was in, in vigilance uh, experiments where you have to watch for something. All the researchers just know that your, your psychological vigilance gradually deteriorates over time keeping your attention out to watch for that signal. And it wasn't just lab studies either. It was true in the Navy in World War II where you're watching for a blip that might mean a submarine mm -hmm. that's going to mean instant death for uh, for you and everybody on the ship. I mean, life, life or death, it doesn't get more important than that. And yet even so, keeping your attention focused and noticing everything, that, that ability degrades over time. So there is deterioration within the same task. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes that gets offset by people become more automatic uh, uh, with things or they learn habits and, and then that gets easier because the mind is very well designed also to spare the load on the, the conscious control mm -hmm. part of it because that, that's, that's expensive. So uh, that's why things become automatic and we easily form habits and, and skills and so on because uh, then it just goes smoothly automatically and you don't have to use as much. Nevertheless, um, the general pattern is that uh, uh, depleting willpower in any sphere will uh, interfere uh, and reduce the odds of success in anything else that you do uh, soon after that. <coughs> but is, is that tapping into the same budget that you use for all choices, right? So, you know, you, you referenced choice fatigue in, mm -hmm. in the book um, and, and, you know, just – constantly making decisions, constantly making choices, even if those choices don't involve anything around temptation, right? So if you have to decide what right. color suit to wear in the morning and, you know, what, what right. type of breakfast you're going to have in the morning, do, do those, does that constant uh, deciding make it more difficult to resist temptation? Um, you know, people who are in, in the choice yes, world, they I, talk I about, they talk about rules. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say, okay, I'm just gonna wear the same suit every day, then that frees up resources to think about more important things. So d d is the kind of yeah, I think, uh, designing President rules Obama helpful? Made that. Yeah. President Obama made that famous, I think it was right after our, uh, our stuff came out in the, the New York Times Magazine. I, I assume he didn't read our research. Somebody on his staff mentioned it to him. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, he said, I don't want to waste any of my energy deciding what to eat or what to wear. So he just had blue or gray suits and just grabbed one each day. And uh, I assume at some point he told the chef what he liked to eat and then just said, surprise me. Uh, so he could conserve his energy. And I know uh, Zuckerberg, the Facebook guy, and others have picked up that same strategy. They they, they seem to think it works. Uh, it, it makes sense. Uh, to me, uh, supportive evidence is that most people have a routine in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you could make a decision about everything all anew every morning, like, what do I want for breakfast? Should I have a shower first, or then have breakfast, or breakfast, and then shower, and, uh, and all those things. But 
a lot of people get up, do the same things in the same order, eat the same foods, drive the same way to work, uh, and so on. And that's good. That's adaptive because it conserves your energy for the challenges of the day that are more important than uh, uh, whether I should have a shower before I uh, fry the eggs. Mm -hmm. So do, do we need to rehabilitate this notion of, of character and character development? Do, do we need to make character development a more explicit part of, of education, a more explicit part of, of child rearing, maybe even a more explicit part of uh, self-help? Well, need is a strong word that psychologists have to be careful. <laughs> uh, it would probably do some good if we've revived notions of character and, and building character and put more of it in, in education. Uh, things seem to be going in the other direction and have been for half a century. So I don't have a lot of faith in any imminent turnaround. Uh, but there are people who are studying character and working on character development. And uh, so um, there are some, some promising signs. But uh, uh, so to answer your question, I don't know that we need it. I do think it would be good if we did it. <laughs> and I rather doubt that uh, we're going to be doing it in a big way anytime soon. Well, Roy, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of really wonderful books, incredibly well-written. Um, definitely check out The Power of Bad, Willpower, Self-Explained, and, and all the rest of them. Uh, look forward to seeing a couple more books down the, down the road, and hopefully we can meet again sometime soon in person. Okay, I'd be glad to do that. Thanks very much. It's been a great interview. This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM. Connecting people through stories.